Hello and welcome to the Six Perfections with Venerable Yinton at Land of Medicine Buddha. We're glad you're all here. Good to see you all. Sorry to not be in the Gompa, but here we are all together on Zoom and how lucky are we? Good to see you all. So as of uh, Monday, Land of Medicine Buddha is under a temporary closure to in-person visitors. So until April 1st, our trails, our center, our bookstore are closed. And fortunately, our beautiful teachings online are still here and will continue to be here. If you're not on our mailing list, please get on it so that you can be notified of all of the teachings happening online. We're blessed that they're here. And I feel super blessed that you guys are all here to enjoy. Okay, so we'll start with setting our motivation as usual. Wasangi Chudam Sogi Chunam Lai Jancho Padu Dani Kapsuchi Adagi Junyan Gi Pesonam Gi Drola Penche Sangi Drupa Show Sangi Chudam Sogi Chunam La Jancho Padu Dani Kapsuchi Dagi Junyan Gi Pesonam Gi Rola penche sange drupa sho sange churam sogi churam ha janju padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange drupa sho. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtue over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratamoksha, Bodhisattva, and Tantric vows even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so we go for refuge until we're enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by our merits from giving and other perfections, may we become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And really letting that motivation settle in, repeat it in your mind, let it connect.
And so we're reminded that a perfection or a paramita, these are aspirations and activities directed towards achieving Buddhahood. And that they are generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom. And that we've been looking at patience, which is forbearance with suffering. And then later today, we're gonna to be looking at joyous effort, which is enthusiasm for beneficial actions. So last time we were looking mainly at patience when we are suffering. So managing physical and mental pain. And this last one, patience of keeping con concentration or certitude of the Dharma, we might get to, but basically it's having confidence and patience with your Dharma practice. So patience when we are suffering is where we left off. Um, when we suffer, we point to someone or something outside of ourselves as the cause. The immediate reason for our suffering may be something outside, but the deep or underlying cause is our own karma, which is of our own doing, which is not to blame yourself. We know this, yes, but it has to be reminded every single time we start talking about karma, because karma has the connotation of punishment and reward, and that is not what's being said. We all made mistakes. Those mistakes come back around, just natural cause and effect. But if we don't like the effect, we just stop creating the cause. And cause and effect are always of a concordant type. So if you're experiencing something like sickness, what's, the, what's something that you can do to increase health and life of sentient beings? or to protect the life of sentient beings. So you're just really checking, what do I not want to keep happening? Let's stop creating the causes for that. So without any kind of like moral heaviness, lots more strategic maneuvering in terms of our own inner habits. So when we were looking at this one, there was these points about how suffering actually has good qualities. Right? There was a lot of really amazing things about suffering. And almost as if, at least for us beginners, we need suffering to be motivated to practice. And there are advantages of bearing suffering. It makes us more resilient. It makes us have more fortitude. Um, you know, And it's not actually difficult to bear suffering with practice. In fact, we already do it in certain contexts if we like what it leads to. So we did this meditation at the last um, part of last week when we were looking at the reflection on the good qualities of patients. So as you're looking through that, did you have any interesting insights during the meditation last time where you thought, I hadn't considered that before, that's really quite true? Or I really disagree with that, that's really rubbing me the wrong way, or anything like that as you look at that list. Just pop right in if you have some thoughts about it. So if you wanted to put it in just everyday language, and someone was saying to you, so Buddhists are all about reframing suffering, what do they do to reframe suffering and make it a positive? What would you say just conversationally? How can you make suffering good in your mind? Good, but not masochistic. Useful. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I would like to share something very personal with, uh, with you, with all. Um, I had the um, uh, diagnosis with uh, cancer twice in my life. Like once, the first time I was younger and even I knew that uh, Buddhism is all about compassion and um, I was very angry and um, it hadn't uh, been something positive. It hadn't uh, adjust me myself as a person in my motherhood and in my, it was only I was very angry. And uh, Time passes by 10 years after, I uh, more than 10, 15 years after I had uh, the second time I had another one. The, I was fortunate to um, get out of it like last year. But since I, I, my approach with this uh, cancer was totally um, 
compassionate. And the compassion and pa patient begins with myself. There was no guilt. There was no anger. It was only like moment to moment of sometimes joy, sometimes sadness, sometimes very, very powerful experience. And I think the Buddhism uh, for all of us, I hope nobody had cancer, but uh, for me personally, um, the second time, it, uh, comparing to the first time, it's not the same. Uh, it was nearly very bad the second time, but it wasn't uh, worse than the first time because of my approach. Yeah. So I think I... Uh, I understand a little bit what is uh, what can suffering do for us, like a positive approach of suffering to be compassionate with ourselves first and with others. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Ladan. And I think that there's a really important piece in there, which is you weren't pretending you weren't having cancer. <laughs> you know, you weren't pretending that it wasn't hard. And sometimes what we want to do is we know how we're supposed to reframe things. We know the way in which we're supposed to think as Dharma practitioners or people who are on some sort of path of intentional living or transformative living or healing. We know where we're supposed to go. So we jump over the fact that it hurts. And we say, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. And really what we have to say is, it's really bad. It's horrible. And that is good. Yeah. Not to skip the step of, I did not want this. This is not what I wanted in my life. This is so hard. This is interrupting everything. This is making everything more difficult. I don't want this. You have to sit with the truth of that before you can transform it. And if you jump the step, then it comes back and it bites you. And it either bites you in a way where when you meet someone else with a similar suffering, you're a little dissociative. You don't want to really be present with them because it's bringing up all of your stuff. It's reminding you of all of your angst around your old suffering. So you kind of, you know, you're nice, you're kind, you're patient-ish, but you're not totally present with them because you're too triggered yourself. So you might jump into logistics and problem solving and advice giving. And basically what you're trying to do is to get them to not be suffering around you. Yeah. And, and you don't want them to suffer but not because of compassion, but because it's uncomfortable for you to be around their suffering. Yeah. And, you know, it's totally human and we all do it. But if you've really met your own pain and met your own resistance and then moved through into transforming it and thinking through it in a different way, then you can sit with other people's stuff and you don't have agitation in response to it. You can just bear witness you can just hold the space. You can just be compassionate. And you also have enough mental space to notice when do they have openness for a suggestion or a support? And when do they just need me to shut my mouth and be there? Just be there. Yeah, just sending them love, not needing them to change or do or be anything other than what they are. Because probably they'll come to their own solutions if they feel supported and safe. And it's so much more empowering to come to your own solutions than to be sort of, I don't know, force them from someone else, even if they're the right decisions or the right plans. If someone else kind of forced you into it or pushed you to do it, sometimes it doesn't feel as empowering and you don't have the same ownership of your own solutions. And then the confidence that builds from having ownership of your own solutions. So a lot of this self-compassion work that we do is being brave enough to sit with our pain, brave enough to sit with our potentiality, which sometimes is scarier than our pain. Yeah, the fact that we have the potential to become enlightened, the fact that the mind is changeable, the fact that suffering is removable is really overwhelming sometimes. Sometimes it's easier to just kind of default into I am slightly uncomfortable and angsty but oh well <laughs> right that's what I know yeah 
somehow it, yeah true. working towards enlightenment can be a little overwhelming yes uh, everything can be overwhelming but uh, uh it's a uh, it sounds like a cliche. I, I won't tell it to somebody is, uh, who is suffering from, from cancer or is going through chemo. Or I, I don't tell them, but it's, it's cliche, but it's true that even if in your suffering and in other suffering of all sentient beings, there's some moments of bliss. There's some moment of very hardship. There's some moment of sadness. and because of, of uh, Buddhism teaching that I had it some, somehow in my mind, but I felt it like really it was shaking me. Yeah. And it's very powerful. And thank you, Venerable. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's big, big stuff. And probably every single one of us is somehow touched by something like cancer, whether it's us or a family member or loved one. So it's, it's very present and real in our life, 100%. It's Teresa? It's, I'm tired of being on Zoom. I just have to say that. I've been doing this all day <laughs> and I really like being in person. And I've heard other people say that. And I think, why? It's so great. At this moment, I'm not feeling it's so great. So, um, like <laughs> Own, owning your suffering in this moment, very good. I'm owning my suffering in Modeling. this moment. Very good. <laughs> um, I had cancer twice, like Ladong, actually. And while I had cancer, many of my Buddhist friends would say, You're bu burning up negative karma like jet fuel. And it would just piss me off as if just suffering meant less suffering in the future. Then the way you described it last week, it really made sense to me. Like I can look back now and say, I mean, so many benefits from that. I can't even begin to name them. There's so many benefits. But while I was in the middle of it was not the time to tell me you're so fortunate. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> so like so many things in the teachings that I've been to with you, it's like these ideas of the benefits of suffering. I never got that. And then when you described it last week, it really made sense to me like, oh, yeah, it makes me not want to suffer in the future and also be very grateful for things I've had in the past. So then I'm burning up negative karma like jet fuel, but not just because I'm suffering. That just never made sense to me. Bad things are happening to you. You're so lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's again, it's that jumping to the reframe too soon and without nuance, right? Yeah. It's missing a lot of nuance, a lot of detail, a lot of reasons why and how to think. And it's a sort of shorthand we can get into with really any system that we love. It could be psychology, it could be hiking, it could be cooking, it could be anything. We're so used to the vocabulary that we skip steps when explaining it to someone. And it might be someone that also understands the system, but you've missed looking at the person in front of you mm. and being like, what do they in this moment need to hear or need me to be not what's the default things that a person says in this instance yeah. you know like autopilot <laughs> you know here are the and autopilot dharma things to say when someone's struggling tick 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 now i've done the list feel better and, and I, this is like no I, I think you just described it so well you know i was young and very very sick and I think it stressed people out. To be honest, they didn't know what to say to me. Like I'm literally losing everything in my life at a very young age and people didn't know what to say. So the best thing they could say was how fortunate you are. You're burning up negative karma. <laughs> so I can have compassion for them. I know they were trying to help and it didn't bring about an understanding of the benefits of suffering. It didn't work. Yeah, you needed a hug and a soup and, you know, <laughs> someone to watch stupid TV shows with and a cat or something, you know, like you didn't need the radical reframe, you needed a fuzzy blanket. <laughs> yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and I think this is so important when we're looking at how self-awareness is the key to all transformation, is the key to benefiting others. Because if you really are sitting with when I am in a state 
you know, in a state of suffering, when I'm in it, when I'm believing in it, when I'm stuck into it, what actually helps? What actually helps me regain mental clarity and mental space to access the tools I already have? Yeah, an injection of new tools in that moment will not work. <laughs> new tools later, when I settle down, I may access, and that's wonderful, and that's what, how we want to be. But in the moment of angst, what actually helps things roll through is usually just compassionate presence from other people who are often not talking. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And they're all angsty and anxiety ridden because they want to say the right thing. In fact, you just need them to hang out with you and not be offended when you tell them to bugger off. You know, it's so basic that um, we overthink it. Talia? Similar to the point that you just made, you were asking about the benefits of suffering. And I've noticed, like I developed some chronic pain and because of it, now, anytime I talk to someone with chronic pain, I immediately, like everything you're talking about, like how to just sit there and be like, that sucks. But like in a way that they can feel as genuine comes from the fact that I've experienced it. And in a, in a weird way, that's actually been a huge benefit of it is that through experiencing it, that compassion is not contrived. It's because of just, you know, going through it, going through the days, like all the nuances of what it means to have that condition, right? Which is, it's like trying to describe the country of France, like. France? Yeah. Yes, France, right? Like, like, how do you do that? Well, it's, you just got to go there. So I think that's one benefit I've noticed from all the forms of suffering I've gotten to experience in this life. Yeah, I'm with you. And it, it also helps you not be offended by people's suffering responses too. Like if someone ghosts you, you know, like you text them and they don't text you back and you know that they're suffering, you're not like as likely to be offended because you know, when you've run out of gas and you, you know, you're in chronic pain or you're recovering from having been in chronic pain and now you're in like a rest and recovery day, that even that something as simple as looking at your phone, looking at a person who wants feedback and then typing in, yeah, I'm fine, is exhausting. Whereas when you're fine and you're healthy, you're like, yeah, I'm fine, do to do, but it takes being fine to say that. <laughs> You know, and if you know what something like chronic pain and illness does to your energy levels, does to your ability to cope, then you see that in someone else and you just give them space and you're like, yeah, fair enough. We'll talk whenever. It's fine. Like whenever, you know, and I'm not going to give up on you just because some of your social norms are sliding and some of your social skills are degrading. It's fine because that's what suffering does to us. Yeah. Yeah, so it helps you not be offended. Suffering is so helpful. And of course, we don't need to chase it. Plenty will come just sitting still in samsara. Right? Suffering will come. And somehow to get yourself ready to meet it differently. So you're meeting it with a, with a mind that says, this is so uncomfortable. No doubt it will come in handy someday. Yeah. Rather than saying, this isn't uncomfortable, this isn't uncomfortable, you're saying, this is uncomfortable, this will come in handy someday. So there's like a mental joy together with the, oh, <laughs> yeah. And, and that does change your view of it and it changes your resistance to it. So yeah, so suffering is a huge one to, to keep coming back to again and again with patience. And whether it's physical suffering or mental suffering, the approach is the same. Um, you know, and this one of dispelling arrogance, dispelling arrogance also can be dispelling isolation. Because when you don't get certain kinds of suffering, you're so detached from it, that it's hard for you to relate. And when you're kind of in this arrogant, I don't know what's wrong with people, I'm, I would never behave that way, I'm so above this, that looking down on others, prideful response, is also very isolating and alienating and makes you feel separate from society. Um, this can be really helpful with particularly mental suffering. So, you know, before, you know, before every election, there's all sorts of, you know, conflict with various friends and relatives who don't have the same politics as you. And you might have the arrogance of how could they think that? 
how stupid is it that they think that whatever it is, either side, any side, right? You can think, oh, they're so stupid. They're so closed minded. They're so uneducated. They're so this, they're so that. And if you have the suffering knowledge and the suffering wisdom of what it feels like to be intellectually intimidated, you know, you're with someone who is just obviously smarter and more educated than you and how stupid you feel if they are using that as a weapon. And you take that knowing. And then you take the suffering of, so there have been times when some government service or other has not functioned well for the needs that I had. And the frustration and the distrust that you have on the back of that. And you sort of take all of those sufferings and you think, my conclusions are different than my loved one with different politics, but my conclusions are different only because my life has been different. My exposure to things has been different. What I've encountered has been different. If I had had their exact, exact, precise same life, I would be coming to very similar conclusions. And so it dispels arrogance if you kind of can revisit times when you've suffered in parallel ways to how they seem to be suffering. It, part of what blocks compassion is not being able to relate. Yeah, keep thinking about that deeper and deeper. When you lose compassion for someone or you can't have compassion for someone and it's blocked, you usually say in your head, I just don't understand why they dot, 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 fill in the blank. I just don't understand why they, I just don't understand why people, I just don't, and you use that as like ammunition to prove why your anger is justified rather than that very same information of, oh, if I understood, then I wouldn't be mad. <laughs> if I understood, I would relate and be sympathetic. I wouldn't need to agree. Agreeing is a whole other thing, but I wouldn't be as kind of reactive if I understood. Yeah. So, you know, we just keep coming back to these things using our own life as the example. Yeah. And just again and again, everything, happiness or suffering, is fuel for the path if we decide it is. And if we decide it isn't, then it isn't. You know, we're not waiting for some divine being to bestow a lesson on us. We're being flooded with opportunities to choose a lesson or not, you know, so then it becomes just about pacing. How much space do you have for transformation today? And it might be different than yesterday's space for transformation. Yesterday, you might have been in a holding pattern and not been able to stretch at all. No worries. Different conditions. Today's conditions, what are they like? You know, and then you start kind of pacing yourself based on you know, general day-to-day -day norms, but also knowing what would be possible for you on your hardest days, either physically or mentally. Even if it's just squeaking out one little om, mommy, pedme, whom, as you drag yourself from the bed to getting your toothbrush, to brushing your teeth in the morning. Om, mommy, pedme, and that's it. But it's something that is not so self-referent because self-cherishing makes you the center of the universe, but it's a suffering center. Yeah, it's a suffering center of the universe where your pain blocks your ability to see the pain of other people. And you can't compute other people's pain because yours is so consuming. So if you're trying to overcome self-cherishing and have bodhicitta and engage with the perfections, you have to consciously widen your focus which in no way negates your own pain. It just places it in the correct perspective and context, which immediately makes you feel connected to other people. Yeah, I am not the only one who suffers this way. That doesn't mean I don't get sympathy or compassion. That's not why we're thinking that. We're thinking I'm not the only one that suffers this way. Oh, therefore I don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of coping mechanisms. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm not the only one who suffered this way, right? Like so-and-so and so-and-so who got through it and are okay. That shows me I could be okay. You know, so you're doing comparison in a healthy way rather than the way we were trained, which is don't just think about yourself. Other people are suffering and it's got all this judgment and heaviness to it. 
you're, you're doing this comparison as a way to relate and connect and expand back out into the human experience. Okay, enough for now. So joyous effort, yay, joyous effort. Um, so joyous effort is delight in virtue. So Geshe-la says, um, the first is energy of the mind that stops the desire for unprofitable things. If we have a strong desire for ordinary things disconnected from Dharma, it disrupts our Dharma practice. Although we do have to do everyday things, if our fondness for them is greater than our fondness for Dharma, our attention is taken away from our main work. A person may concentrate and work very hard, but if the goal of all of that effort is a worldly one, then according to Dharma, that person is lazy. People who really want to practice Dharma are in a hurry, even when eating or excreting so as not to waste time. Energy for worldly things is weakness. Energy for Dharma is real strength. This aspect of the perfection of energy or joyous effort speeds us quickly towards the final goal. Having energy for Dharma practice, the real purpose of life, prevents our being distracted by worldly goals and it protects us from all kinds of bad things. So there's two words I wanna pull out here. One is energy and one is weakness. Also, we'll come back to laziness. When Geshe-la says weakness, what he means is not strength. So we hear weakness with all of these moral connotations, don't we? All these associations of like deficiency in our character, yeah? Weakness, you know, like it's, it's pejorative. It always has this negative connotation of bad. Geshe-la is saying weak in the sense of not having energy. Just much more literally, the English word weak, lacking energy, lacking strength. And it doesn't have a moral heaviness to it. It's about if you're directing your energy towards things that are short term, that's a misplaced use of energy. It's not efficient. If your goal is the deep transformation of Dharma, but you give most of your time to things that are other than that, you're gonna get worn out with no positive result. So it's an inefficient use of energy. Yeah, so weakness in that sense. And then when he's talking about laziness, he's talking about things basically that fall under the category of our inner justification to not practice. Yeah, ways we justify not practicing or avoiding practice. So getting lost in worldly things like, I don't know, shopping, right, for groceries, that's worldly. It doesn't have to be worldly. It's just usually is. So if we're going to the grocery store with a mind of, I have to pick up this, this, and this, I need to get out of there by this time, I need to get this kind of parking space, and you're just in it, let's get it done. That is a lot of mental energy for a very worldly goal. If your mentality is, I have my list of groceries I need to get, in order to have a strong, healthy body to benefit sentient things. And may anyone I see or hear or interact with have a positive experience because of me. Then it becomes Dharma practice, the exact same errand. So it could take the exact same amount of time, but suddenly that energy is not wasted. It's kind of plugged into the momentum of your whole path. And you'll find also the side effect you're less stressed. It feels, self-cherishing lies, right? Self-cherishing lies and says it feels inefficient to set a motivation to go to the grocery store and to get organized and mindful for the grocery store. I've just got things to do, I gotta do them. Yeah, that's what self-cherishing says. Just get through it, you gotta get the job done. But really, the recovery time is gonna be a lot longer if you go into the grocery store stressed right? It eats your energy, it, you get fatigue, you find other people to be obstacles and aggravations, you don't relate to them, they're all problems to get around. And then after you get home and you put your stuff away, you're kind of like, oh, now I don't have energy to do anything. That's taken the whole day. But if you spent five seconds in your car before you got out and thought the purpose of my life is what? 
Yeah, what? Happiness and its causes. Becoming enlightened for the benefit of others. May all of my interactions be of benefit to them. It is a five second conversation with yourself. It doesn't take any time. And then you get out and you do the things and now people are amusing and delightful or they're aggravating and behaviors are sort of, you know, kind of life's rich pageant and you don't mind them. And you think, look at those people so stressed. Oh, sometimes that's me. Oh, poor humans. You know, and you see screaming babies and you go, oh, my mom was so patient. I was a screaming baby. Or you remember when you were a young mom and your babies were the screaming ones and how nice it was when there was patient people around you who didn't judge you, you know, and you're just kind of like a part of humanity like a hive of bees or a school of fish, there's that individuality together with connection. And the more connected you feel to your fellow man, the more blissful these ordinary tasks are. And you get home and you're happy. Yeah, you're happy. And you don't binge on all the junk food that you bought because you were stressed because you probably didn't buy as much and you don't have the same need to binge. Yeah, because you don't have to recover. So a lot about joyous effort is minimizing the need to recover from your life because everything in your life becomes in alignment with Dharma. So it's efficient and creates momentum and continuity. So it's just kind of checking, what do I say to myself that actually is just a lie of self-cherishing or how I was taught to function in this world that's actually quite dysfunctional and has never led to the goals that I sought the big goals, you know? And how much of the day do I spend just trying to get through the day, get through tasks, finish stuff, check stuff off my list? You still need to do those things, but if you do those things with a Dharma motivation, there's a spaciousness and the goal of the task is no longer the goal. So not accomplishing the goal of the task is not as stressful but also there's less pressure on it. So you might actually accomplish more worldly goals because you haven't suffocated the room with all of your tension and anxiety about getting stuff done. Yeah. The purpose of my life is to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient things. That's gonna take a while. So then today, what do I have to do today? Okay, a couple of things. Let's move them into my work to benefit sentient things. They'll get done or they won't but that's not really the point of my life. It's just your practice chooses this format today. Some days your practice looks like strict retreat with meditation sessions. Some day your your practice looks like yard work. Doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's completely about what your mind is doing. So, So joyous effort, really hear that as what gives energy as opposed to what takes energy what facilitates momentum as opposed to what blocks it and stifles it. And the big picture is uncomfortable for a narrow mind. And the narrow mind is the self-cherishing mind. And so it will be uncomfortable to expand your awareness and to have the bigger picture in the long view, but it's only gonna be uncomfortable for like three minutes and then it's gonna be way better. Yeah, it's a little bit like little kid tired at the end of the day, you know, they're in their dirty, stinky clothes, you need to get them into the bath, and they do not want to take off their dirty, stinky clothes, and they are grumpy at you, and they're just all sort of worked up, and, you know, what do you do? You try to lure them into the bath with, like, dinosaurs or whatever, you know, (laughs) here's some things, and finally, they, like, you know, in bubble bath, look, bubble bath, and finally, they get in, and then they're so happy right? Once they get in, they're so happy and they're just, and you can't get them out then, right? They're like having a whole fun time with their dinosaurs, right? But you know, the transition is painful. (laughs) Yes. Painful for everyone involved, right? We are exactly the same. Our transition from suffering to happiness is actually a painful transition, but short. So remember that it's short, that shifting from one thing to another is going to have that awkwardness and that kind of unsettled feeling, but actually it's going to be like a wonderful bubble bath when you're two years old and you've got all your plastic toys and it's great. 
Yeah, so just kind of keep that in mind. There's even lots of cool stuff from neuroscience about this, about how long a negative state of mind and an agitated mind can stay if it's not re-stimulated. And if you don't keep stimulating it, it actually only lasts that kind of mood for a couple of minutes. The reason it stays longer is that it keeps being fed. Oh, okay, so joyous effort, right? Good stuff. All right, that's the first one. Um, the second one is the one that protects us against tiredness. So for instance, a meditator who suffers from such tiredness that even the mere sight of the meditation place brings on sleep overcomes this weakness by this kind of energy. So one way to stop this fault is to consider the fruit of meditation or Dharma practice. If we bear this in mind, bodily tiredness does not make us lose our energy. People at work do not suffer very much from tiredness because they are thinking of the money they will get. If we consider the great fruit of practicing Dharma, we will work hard at it. High lamas living in the mountains with very little food and sleep are not tired and complaining. Rather, they are very happy because they see that the fruit of their work is near. These lamas have many different ways of practicing Dharma. Some are always teaching, others live alone in the mountains and accept perhaps one or two pupils. So this thing about tiredness being kind of counteracted by keeping your eye on the prize, this can be a little bit difficult and delicate to get just perfectly synchronized for yourself as an individual. So can you think of like a real life example where the work was hard, but the goal was so intriguing that you actually didn't mind the effort of the work. Something like, you know, you heard about how beautiful the view was gonna be at the top of this mountain and you started the hike and it was a bit longer than you thought it was gonna be and you were starting to get a bit worn out, but you were so delighted with the idea of this view that you just kept on. Yeah, and you kept on and you kept like, the view is going to be so good. And when we get to the top of the mountain, we're going to have our picnic and drink our water and just enjoy the view and each other. It's going to be so great that actually the hardship of getting there, it was hard, but it didn't worry you. Yeah, so you're tired in a totally different way. It's just your body, not your mind. So if the body and mind are tired, then it takes a long time to recover. But if it's just the body... Sometimes you just have to feed it and sleep it and give it some water and it perks right up. Yeah, depending on the day, of course. But if your mind has joined in to the pain party, it's going to take way longer. Yeah, if you were forced to hike up the mountain because you were in basic training, I don't know, you're from Israel and you have to go through basic training because all of the kids do, and you're forced to march up this mountain oh man, the resistance and the grumbliness and who cares about the view, this, you know, stupid drill sergeant. You don't want to, you don't like it. You get to the top, you're like, yeah, it's a nice view. Who cares? This was stupid. And the fatigue is so much more because it's got mental fatigue wrapped up with it. So we have to think about the goal in the right way because of course the goal of Buddhahood is not something that will show itself to us like the peak of a mountain after one day of hiking. It's going to take a really long time, but we can see micro peaks. And to be kind of really thinking about in the past, where are the peaks or the summits that I've already achieved to kind of give me this delight? So, so really think about, all right, the last hard day I had, what were some of the reactions I had that were different than how I would have been 10 years ago? Yeah, and you think, yeah, the stress of that was so much less, or my speech was so much more skillful, or my ability to own my mistakes was more, and taking responsibility and apologizing came a lot easier because I wasn't so identified with my stuff. And you just take a moment and really sit with your delight in that. These private little victories that no one but you knows. And you use that to help you get yourself to the next summit. Yeah. So with Dharma practice, you know, it's, it's a million little choices. And so it's hard to keep coming back to study, to keep coming back to your meditation, because in that one moment, 
the change is not so obvious. But even in one moment, if you let yourself see it, it will be. Have you had those meditations where you didn't want to sit, you sat, you didn't feel like sitting the whole time you were doing the sit, you were grumpy, but you just sat through it and kept trying. But then afterwards, you actually felt really clear and quite grounded and settled. The session itself was hard work and it was not particularly enjoyable that day. And so part of you thought that meditation session was a failure, but actually the result afterwards was I actually feel quite grounded and clear today. I wonder why. Oh, right, I did do my practice. Sometimes we think that during the practice itself has to be the proof of its success. But during the practice itself is hit and miss because there's so many conditions. Some days it's blissful, some days it's hard. Some days you're falling asleep, some days you're full of ideas, some days you're, you know, what a million things can happen. But the, the power of just trying again and again is what's going to keep the continuity and the momentum. I don't know. Do you see any potential pitfalls in kind of overcoming your tiredness by holding on to a goal? Can you see like ways that you might go off track thinking this way? And can you think of some ways that might actually be effective that are personal and specific to you? Like what kind of goals are achievable enough? in your Dharma practice to give you the confidence and the fortitude to keep going with a kind of a lift and a joyfulness? So uh, one thing I, I've been thinking about um, is that like, I, I used to really set goals based on like fear of a bad outcome, um, even just like before starting to practice and how exhausting that was and like how much anxiety, like just the mental effort of anxiety um, how much that like takes out of me and just, and thinking about now I'm, I'm trying to start reframing things with like more positive goals. And I mean, it's not easy. I don't think I'm there yet, but it does seem to require like less, like, like I'm less tired at the end of whatever I'm doing. If it's not like, Oh, I'm afraid this bad thing will happen, or I have to make sure not to do this to avoid this terrible outcome, but think about it like in a more, positive way like um one thing in particular lately I've just been having a lot of anxiety with driving um and I don't know how many of you live in the bay area since we're all on zoom but it's gotten really bad lately um and you know thinking more like oh I want to like oh I'm like so afraid of getting in an accident I don't want to drive um or like I'm you know just feeling stressed out and instead reframing to be like oh well you know, I'm really trying to like protect the lives of, of other beings and be really conscientious. Like, even though it may look the same in what I'm doing, it feels less exhausting somehow. And that's just something mm. I've been trying for the last couple of days. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really skillful. And, and I think that there's like, there's the right way to use the stick and the wrong way to use the stick. Because if it's only positive goals that we seek, sometimes we're like, yeah, but life's not so bad now, eh. you know, and you sort of like make peace with the sort of imperfect life that you're living because it's not that bad. Um, and so having a positive goal, you're like, you know, back and forth between how much effort you want to put in. But then if you're driven by this anxiety of if I don't practice, I'm going to the infinite hell realms and, uh, you know, it's like, oh. um, it will exhaust you just as you were saying. But I think that that idea of um, like driving carefully in order to protect others or create a safe atmosphere for others, that's kind of a nice kind of hit in the sweet spot because it's a positive outcome, but it's also got the edge of if I don't, there could be a consequence. And I don't have to let that weigh heavy on me. I don't have to put too much pressure on myself because of it, but something might be lost. And I don't know about you guys, but if I have a positive goal, plus remember death, not death in a heavy way, but like death in the sense of, if I were to get to the end of my life, having not pursued these things that I love, it would be such a shame. Yeah, not I would be bad, not I would be full of, you know, like not none of that, just there are really beautiful things I aspire to in this life. 
There are things that I think are important and deep. And then I get lost in all these millions of distractions. And if I remember death is coming, but I have no idea when, then I've got the right kind of a stick to kind of make me clarify my priorities, you know, and think if I died next week, I could die with a happy mind because that was a life well lived. And that's a life that if there's a life to come, I will carry with me habit patterns that I value that are that inner refuge of what a wonderful legacy to leave myself, you know? And so, so remembering death in that kind of just a gentle nudge to like not make yourself waste time with the things you already love and value. And um, Julia was adding about her baby. Her baby's adorable. Hi, baby. <laughs> we don't mind crying babies in this group. No, we don't. They're cute. So then there's one more time, a type, um, which is the kind of energy that is confidence that we are not too small, weak, or stupid to obtain the fruit of Dharma practice. So weakness of this kind stands in the way of achievement of the object. So it can be overcome by thinking that the highest Buddhas and Bodhisattvas also once had only delusion, lived in samsara, and were worse than ourselves, possibly. <laughs> and by practicing Dharma, they reach the highest states of perfection. We can do the same. No one has perfect virtue from the beginning. When children first go to school, they cannot even read or write. But later they learn to do not only that, but many other things as well. And some become great scholars. The Buddha said that even insects living in excrement can become Buddhas. If we bear all this in mind, we shall find no reason why we cannot practice Dharma. So this is really about looking at self-esteem. Um, it might seem like in Buddhism, we don't talk much about confidence and self-esteem, we, but we do, right, in this joyous effort section. And it, this one is really asking us to not have false modesty or false humility that says, oh, that, that kind of Dharma practice, oh, that's for advanced people. You know, I'm just little, <laughs> you know, or that's for people that have studied more than me or who are more advanced beings. It's like, sure, there's probably more advanced beings than us, but they had to start somewhere. Um, Milarepa was a serial killer, right? We're not doing so bad, <laughs> you know? And he got enlightened in one life. He was killing people. Right, right. We might have had some unfortunate animal related deaths, but now we've stopped and we're moving on. But probably we were not mass murderers. But even if we were, still not a lost cause. So, you know, it's like you're kind of thinking, right, why am I looking down on my own psyche? Your mind has the potential for perfection. Sort of looking down on yourself is actually seen as a form of laziness in Buddhism. It's like gives yourself permission not to try hard because you're, you know, under the heading of I'm being modest or I'm being humble. So I'm not trying or striving because I'm only little. It's, it's a form of laziness and it can actually lead to um, the laziness of despondency or despair or loss of heart where you really feel like these things are too complicated. They're too beyond you. So why even try? And it's a danger for all of us, particularly in our society where there's so much about ambition and so much about um, proving oneself and, you know, even just the way we behave on social media of just cherry picking the shiny parts of our life to share with others um, or the suffering parts of our life to share with others in a somewhat performative way. You know, it's like we're not really learning how to gauge our own measure. And when I say gauge your own measure, it's really about where are you today? Not this is who I am forevermore, but you're thinking, okay, so I've studied this amount and I've practiced this amount. What is the logical next step? Just really gently, what is the logical next step? I think I need to revisit this in this text that I didn't really understand the first time. I'm gonna revisit those. 
And then that one retreat, I really felt a spark of something. I think I need to pursue that. Yeah. And that's the way to not fall into that laziness of despondency. You're not overestimating and then, you know, pushing too hard and giving yourself an anxiety attack and falling off the deep end and having a psychotic break and never going to Dharma class ever again because you're all worn out, which happens. Yeah. You're just thinking there is a next step from where I am and step by step enlightenment will be achieved. Yeah. So pacing yourself takes correct humility rather than false humility. And correct humility has a great deal of self-confidence at the core. Because anything that you don't know, you just say, I don't know that yet. It's not a fundamental fatal flaw that I don't know that, or that I don't understand that, or I can't do it yet. All it means is that it's new. I have no deficiency, it's just new. So it will be easier if I try <laughs> and try again and try enough times to have clear questions about where I'm stuck. So, it, so it's so important that we get used to being able to gauge our own ability and gauge our own level without overly identifying with it. So just kind of feeling that place of here's where I am so far. Here's what I don't know yet and just kind of keeping that nice and spacious without over-identification. Um, Alex, did you want to ask? Hi, this is Janine. Um, oh, Janine, and I'm, I'm with Alex. No, that's okay. Hello. Um, <laughs> we, so we have poor bandwidth. That's why I don't have video on. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, is this, this thought of, of kind of looking down on myself um, and, and laziness, you know, being engaged with, with the activities that aren't Dharma, it's, it's kind of confusing for me in some ways, because I feel like I've been in, involved with the Dharma for a while. And I've, I've been very um, active with my Dharma community um, back in Connecticut, where, where I've um, come from. Um, but in some ways, I feel like I've done it. I've done those activities, because I feel somehow not able to mm, achieve things in my personal practice it's almost like you know as a distraction almost like oh I, I I won't do my practice because I'm I'm busy you know serving my center or you know because I feel like if I if I try to do the practice yeah, um, I'm losing you, but I, I think that um, I'm losing you just because of the audio. Um, but I think I think I understand yes. what you're saying that that sometimes you put off formal practice in in doing service for your community, which is a Dharma community that you also want to support, and you kind of sacrifice your formal practice because you maybe don't have a ton of confidence that it's going anywhere particularly fast, but you do have confidence in your ability to be a competent, helpful, supportive member of your Dharma community. And there, good work gets done. Is that the kind of dilemma? Yes, that's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's a, it's a really good one because I think we all fall into that sometimes where when are we offering service because offering service is our practice? And when are we offering service to avoid a harder job, which might be quiet, alone, unvalidated, deep dive into our own afflictions and figuring out how to antidote them. And that will be uncelebrated and unapplauded and no one might notice right away. And it might actually show us how far we have to go. And that's very confronting and intimidating. Um, but we're a nice, polite person, like we're not doing too bad. So if we never touch that stuff, it wouldn't be the end of the world because we're, you know, friendly. <laughs> so let's just like do the puja shopping because yeah. that needs to be done and it's tangible and it's finite and tangible finite tasks are satisfying because it's like done, <laughs> you know, working on anger, not going to be able to say, oh, done now for quite some time. You might be able to say done today and still be wrong. Yeah. So uh, it's really that self-knowledge of when is my offering service offering service and when is my offering service avoidance. And only you will know that 
well, you and the Buddhas, right? You and the Buddhas will know that. But the, the kind of the formal practices that we sometimes put off or avoid, it could be that we put off and avoid them from a place of wisdom as well. We could be putting them off because we just don't have enough context for them to seem to be useful yet. We have enough understanding to see how they might be useful for other practitioners, but when we do them, we're missing some pieces. And so it feels a little bit like a waste of time because we don't get it enough. So that, that could be some wisdom of, I value it, I want to do it, but right now it's lip service because I just haven't had enough teachings on it. Yeah, or I haven't been mentored in it enough. And so that's totally fair enough, isn't it? To just say, okay, I'm kind of giving that some space because commentaries on it are rare and hard to find. So may I keep meeting it in every life and may I keep my commitments to the best of my ability, but I might not be doing a deep dive in that practice for some time until I get more context. Totally fine. Don't beat yourself up. Very common. Yeah, you're keeping the connection with the lineage, you're keeping the power of your promises, and that is very, very valuable, and it creates the cause to meet that practice again in future lives. So value it, honor it, but don't stress too much about it not going anywhere. That's, you know, so that could be that wisdom. Um, but again, that can also, the same behavior can be laziness of, here's this commentary I've had on my bookshelf for 20 years, but I have never actually opened it because I will be overwhelmed by the amount there is to do. So pacing, I can't say it enough. It's like, we have not been trained how to read Dharma books. So we open a Dharma book and we start reading it like a novel and we can read it in a couple days, but none of it's stuck because we're not reading it correctly. You know, the way to read it is read one paragraph, put a little sticky note there, stop and just go, huh, so what does that mean? Which practice is that referring to? Go find the practice, look up the section and be like, okay, all right. So then you write a little note. Here's what's clear. Here's what's not clear. Next time I get a Geshe, I'm asking them this. And you get your good Geshe question list going. But it takes such a discipline to read slowly when you're used to just getting through something when you read. It's a totally different discipline. And it's not the same thing as studying for an exam because the exam is just your life. <laughs> yeah. So you could say all the right things, but who cares if they don't mean anything to you? Talia, yeah, what do you think? I have a question about the role of the teacher and helping with that realistic humility and that pacing that you've brought up. Would you speak to that some? And maybe like the correct way to think about the teacher's role versus our own responsibility. Because that's something I've struggled with. And the, what's the right way to be, to, to trust and be devoted to the teacher in that respect, you know? Because in some ways in school, there is a teacher that kind of tells us what the curriculum is and which yeah. is like, next, right? But in Dharma, I find, especially to Buddhism, there is a lot. And yeah, like what to do next is, in some ways things come to mind, but in other ways I'm like, oh, like there seems like a million things to do next. Yeah, yeah. And it's different than school, isn't it? Like, if you were doing a math problem at school, the teacher could come over your shoulder and say, Oh, you got lost there. And then you, you know, work it through again, and then figure out the math problem. <laughs> you know, and the guru is not going to sit there with you on your cushion and be like, going well, going well, boop, 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 stop, 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 stop. Okay, that's where you're stuck. All right, go back. You know, they, they might, if you have a deep receptivity to the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas, but just the real fleshy one, you know, the fleshy teacher with, you know, feet and hands and stuff, they're not going to spoon feed you the Dharma, are they? And if you're wanting mentorship and guidance and specifics to you and your practice, it's rare. You know, you have to set up an appointment. You know, it doesn't happen very often. You need to have your ducks in a row. You need to be organized with your questions and you get there and then you're just kind of overwhelmed with, oh, we get to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Oh my God, you're so wonderful. Here's the present. Okay, I gotta go, you know, which is totally human and totally <laughs> normal. But then you're like, oh crap, I was meaning to ask them about this and this and I didn't know how to frame it. And I gave them too much context. They didn't need all that context. I could have just asked the question, but I had to tell them why I'm asking the question. 
they do not care. They are Tibetan Geshis. They have no interest in the context. <laughs> Just ask the question, <laughs> you know. So even learning how to ask a question of a Tibetan teacher, particularly, that will get an answer is a skill. You know, it's not like it's just going to happen naturally. You have to sit with what is their frame of reference? And then what is their way of communicating Dharma? And how do I get my question into the clearest, simplest, shortest form? Yeah. And then how do I hear what they're saying with an awareness of commentary and nuance? That what they're saying may sound like a simple thing, but it's got layers underneath it that might not reveal themselves for many years. So really the teacher is teaching you in a public class. And we're used to thinking we're gonna get a bit more one-on-one -on -one and a little bit more direct, but they're teaching you in classes when they're teaching you. And you just have to keep your ears open, assuming personal advice is coming to you, even in a general teaching, because it is if you're receptive to it. Even if your teacher is completely ordinary, if you're seeing them as the mouthpiece of the Buddha, the Buddha will get to you through them. But you have to take the teachings really personally, even if it's a topic that doesn't particularly seem to apply to you, to try and hear it as personal advice, you will get personal advice. So, you know, when His Holiness teaches live online on YouTube, if you're just feeling like, I have some questions I would like to ask His Holiness, and I don't know that the borders are gonna open up anytime soon, and I don't know how long the waiting list is, but he is teaching tomorrow night to a random group of scientists. All right, log on and just think about your question. And Your Holiness, what about, Your Holiness, what about? Sometimes he will just answer your question randomly in the middle of a live teaching. And to the rest of the audience, they think that was an odd turn. I didn't expect him to go that direction, but it was just for that one guy in the corner who was asking in their mind. Yeah, so, you know, they hear you. It's just, have we learned how to hear them? Yeah, they do hear you. Just, can you hear them? The books can be your teachers, you know? You think, all right, I'm struggling with whatever practice I'm struggling. And you just kind of stare at your bookshelf and you just let yourself pick one out at random and just open it up and start having a read. Yeah, and then often you will find what you need. So, you know, some of that is kind of mystical and magical. Some of that is psychological. There's a lot of different ways of viewing that kind of stuff. Maybe it's superstitious. Maybe it's the divine. Maybe it's a combo. But the, the main thing I'm trying to say is you have to be proactive in finishing the link. So assume that the teachers are forever throwing out ropes. <laughs> you know, they're throwing out, you know, something for you to catch. And you're sitting there kind of like this, like waiting to be lassoed, when in fact you need to reach back. So as a student, we can't be too passive and we can't wait. If there's something you really wanna know from your teacher, just keep asking them. And if they don't answer you, ask why they won't answer you. Is it too soon for me to know this? Do I not have the karma for this? Shall I change direction with this? You know, but it does, it has to be really proactive and having a few main teachers that are like your big teachers. And then you have some intermediate teachers, which might function more like a bridge can be really useful as well. Cause then you can save your really big questions for your really big teachers and get a lot of your general questions, which are really important, but many people could answer them. You can get teachers who speak your own language and who are a bit more accessible. So there's the teacher and then there's like the teacher, <laughs> isn't there? Yeah, and the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas wants nothing except for your health and well-being and transformation at all times, always. And they're always telling you how. We just start doing all sorts of prayers and practices to get ourselves to listen and to have the merit to hear. And the inner guru and the outer guru are of equal importance. You could have the best teacher on earth, but if the inner guru is sleeping, then what are they talking to? 
Yeah. So have confidence in your ability to hear wisdom because we all do. Yeah. And then you can hear it from anyone, right? It can just be the homeless guy busking on the side of the road. You know, suddenly you're like, oh, wow, that was a profound statement. I could let that change my life if I wanted to. Yeah. All right. So we'll have a little five minute break and then do meditation. Okay, everybody, come on back. And um, for this meditation, again, I'll put some stuff on the um, on the screen, but don't feel like you need to read it. It's uh, just there as a prompt in case you lose the thread. So find yourself a posture that works for meditating. And the most important thing is a straight back. So even if you're laying down on the floor is okay if your body's hurting. Or if you're on a chair, you can prop yourself with some cushions. Or if you're feeling stable on the floor, just come into connection with your body and see if you can get your spine to align. And breathe into your posture, letting go of any tension. And so we'll revive our motivation using these words from Venerable Pema Chudran. She says, what the Bodhisattva commits to isn't a trivial matter. Without enthusiasm, we might push too hard or give up altogether. As the Zen master Suzuki Roshi put it, what we're doing here is so important, we had better not take it too seriously. The key to finding this balance between not too tight and not too loose, not too zealous or not too laid back. When we approach life as an experiment, we're willing to try it in this way and that way, because either way, we have nothing to lose. This immense flexibility is something I learned from the example of Trungpa Rinpoche. His enthusiasm enabled him to accomplish an amazing amount in his life. When some things didn't work out, Rinpoche's attitude was no big deal. If it's time for something to flourish, it will. If it's not time, it won't. The trick is not getting caught in hope and fear. We can put our whole heart into whatever we do. But if we freeze our attitude into for or against, we're setting ourselves up for stress. Instead, we could just go forward with curiosity, wondering where this experiment will lead. This kind of open-ended inquisitiveness captures the spirit of enthusiasm or heroic perseverance. And so just sit with those ideas, kind of identify for yourself what is joyous effort, this heroic perseverance or enthusiasm? What is this effort that is not too tight, not too loose?
And now ask yourself what stands in the way of your own joyous effort. Just looking at these three types of laziness or weakness and explore the first one, the mind that will not turn to Dharma. So when does your mind get so obsessed with worldly things, to-do lists, errands, work issues, family issues? When do you mentally put aside Dharma motivation and get lost in just getting through the day? Just try and notice that kind of headspace in yourself, that kind of habit. When does it happen? What does it look like? We might be incredibly busy. No one would ever think to call us lazy, but we're busy avoiding something deeper. And then again, personally and experientially, when do you get this second type, this kind of fatigue when we practice that comes from having a short-sighted goal rather than a long-term goal of full enlightenment? Maybe when our practice gets performative or when we want to see quick outcomes Just kind of explore, when do you get this fatigue related to Dharma? And what do you think fuels it for you personally? And sometimes this looks like procrastination, putting things off, avoidance. Sometimes this looks like going too fast, pushing too hard, and then burning out, giving up altogether. So very privately and honestly to yourself, ask, where is my level? And what would it mean to level up? In my own Dharma practice, study-wise, sitting-wise, just kind of assess where you're at. And have engaged that, what would be the logical next step to go more deeply. Something sustainable, 
gentle. And then just check in if you have this third type, the doubt in our own ability to achieve the aims of the Dharma, the person who wants to get to the top of a mountain has to first turn to the path, second to keep going and not give in to the laziness, and third not to falter and think, this is possible for strong people, but not for me. So just consider what times do you let yourself off the hook for deeper practice? Not from wisdom or being practical, but when you're actually having low self-confidence, putting yourself down, false humility, false modesty, which is actually an escape from the deeper work, gives yourself permission not to practice. Do you ever fall into that one? What does it look like for you? And so think these three types of weakness or three types of laziness are so common, are so part of the human condition that they've been on this list for hundreds, thousands of years. So you are not uniquely bad or inefficient. This should be a great relief that these common problems are as old as time as old as humanity. And the good news is none of them are our true nature. All these ways that we become inefficient or stagnant or blocked, these are all removable. And so just imagine that your mind of self-cherishing that stifles your energy gets put aside as you adjust back into your bodhicitta motivation. That the purpose of this life, of all lives, is to develop this mind. to develop it to its utmost extent. And that this development opens our heart, increases our wisdom, and makes it so that we are of such benefit to sentient beings. And that is our birthright, integration of method and wisdom. 
And so bring that method and wisdom to the forefront of your mind and imagine that you fill up with it and radiate it out in all directions in the form of Om Mani Peme Hum, which encompasses all six perfections. Om Mani Peme Hum 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 Allow the mantra to continue to fill and reverberate out, thinking that your compassionate wisdom activates the compassionate wisdom in others. A ripple effect. Om Mani Peme Hum. And we dedicate. Jancho Sancho Rinpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyo Chi Ke Pa Nyam Pa Me Pa Hi Go Ne Go Ndu Pa Wa Sho Do Ni Da Wa Rinpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyo Chi Epa nyampa me pahi, gone gondu pawashu. And you can relax your attention. Okay, thanks everybody. And uh, your assignment for the week, should you choose to accept it, is just to look at what gives energy, what takes energy. You don't even have to do anything about it, just try to notice. Have a good night.